Okay, uh, this week's material, we're continuing our look at the work we've been doing on young people in hospitality. And um, as usual, breaking up into three parts with the first two parts um, joined by Julia Coffey. Uh, so part one is on gender work and heterosexy luminosity. So Julia, tell us a little bit about yourself and what your research is. Okay. So uh, yeah, I'm a sociologist of youth and gender primarily. And I'm also obviously a part of the Newcastle Youth Studies Centre with Steve and Julia Cook and others who you're probably are hearing from in the course. Um, so the research I've been doing on this project is the Effective Labour um, Project. Um, I've been mainly focused on the gender analysis and the working practices of the young people um, in bars and front of house service labour. Yep. Um, yeah. So, so far we've kind of looked at the kind of creation of vibe and the way the class plays out. Um, so tell us a little bit about the um, the gender and the kind of stuff about the luminosity and the, um, the way the gender is kind of a, both a value and a risk in the mm, field. Sure. Um, so, yeah, when we came to do the project, we, we sort of found that one of the main aspects of the work that was going on in these spaces was often taken for granted by young people and in a gendered, very much a gendered way, um, taken for granted and just expected they knew the kind of performances, particularly young women, that they would have to do in bar work. Um, but they were usually the things that people wouldn't talk about on the on the surface if you look at the yeah. service labour yeah. um, industry and the, the literature on that. So the working practices of the young women they describe them as, you know, the particularly gender things they would have to do. So um, looking right would mean, you know, dressing in a particularly um, feminine way, but also in some of the more boutique bars and things that we looked at, it was also dressing in kind of an alternative way. But all of these things are very important because they were how the young women in particular would be valued as good workers mm. um, that had nothing to do with the, well, might have a little bit to do with the kind of serving practices and, you know, obviously able to pour a drink, have hold a conversation, but also provide a particular kind of gendered experience for the patron, which was to yep. be warm and to, to help sort of smooth the relations so that if they were annoyed about anything, that would make them feel better um, yep. and sort of also perform a, a kind of really fun, lighthearted kind of um, femininity. Yep. So yeah. So it's like different venues will have different tastes going on. So people dress differently and kind of, you know, the trying to bring in a certain customer. So there's a kind of taste way of presenting themselves. Hmm. But the gendered aspects goes beyond that, isn't it? Of course, yeah. females are expected to do a form of emotional and aesthetic labour that just goes beyond the way they look. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And it would be um, the way they would have fun with their other um, colleagues that were working with. That was yeah. all part of the performance. But it was also, you know, it was also hard to draw a line as it being a performance sometimes because it would be just they were being asked to bring their whole kind of personalities and who they were, but not just personality. It's also, you know, gendered subjectivities, yeah. which is not just your personal identity, but the um, the way you're positioned in relation to, you know, the broader cultural and gender yeah. norms so or, or race norms or yeah, yeah. those ones in a society. You kind of you bring all of those. Yeah. And you don't get to choose those ones. Yeah, you yeah, know? yeah. Like, so we've talked a little bit so far about how this kind of labour makes blurry the difference between production and consumption and work and leisure and that kind of thing. Um, and there's an extra kind of layer going on here in terms of the kind of gendered and sexualized nature of what's going on. Mm -hmm. So how does this kind of relate to this notion of the feminine luminosity? Mm. Um, well, in this kind of the luminosity term comes from Angela McRobbie and it's one of the ways she describes um, feminine subjectivities in post-feminist late capitalist societies yep. where particular forms of value are attached to particular performances of femininity. Yeah. Um, and it'll usually, she says, it's usually white women who luminosity is attached to and it'll be sort of this cloud-like um, sort of affective uh, vibe really mm. of um, beauty, of success, of wealth, um, all of those kind of ideal subject positions. Wellness. Wellness. We'll yeah, we'll, we'll talk yeah. about yeah. as well. Um, so those luminosities is really, I guess, a way of sort of 
it's like a sparkly kind of bright term and that kind of affective performance was what young women yeah. would bring into we, they knew they were being expected to bring it into their laboring practices um and often it was just part of how they're already used to being in the world as a young you know heterosexual attractive woman yeah but um they're also yeah it also kind of wedged them in other ways because then it would also be associated with other kinds of gendered yep. things which were much nastier, yep. you know. So the, the luminosity has kind of a connotation of warmth or something as well. But yeah. Okay, so let's have a look at some of the data that we um, collected. Mm. So um, here's the kind of classic creating vibe kind of stuff. So, yep. yeah, what's going on here? Yeah, so it was interesting the way that they described it because it's... It, these luminosities are not something that that's so sort of taken for granted and expected in the workplace um, by employers. So it was interesting to us the times when those kind of invisibilities and gender things were said out loud or made explicit. Um, so, you know, Catherine said she was aware that, you know, it had been said to her outright that um, all the women behind the bar are quite attractive and, you know, that's what the employer wanted. Yeah, management said that. Management yeah. said yeah. that. So it was quite rare to have something as explicit as, explicit as yeah. that. Usually it was just like, no, yeah. like it just taken for granted as the case and obvious. Yeah. So yeah. it was it was good when occasionally it was yeah, yeah. quite a bit said out loud because it would confirm kind yeah. of what everyone knows. Yeah. Um, yeah, so she didn't like being positioned in that way, that people, women in particular in this study would often talk about those kinds of, yeah, taken for granted things um, and, and be really critical of them at the same time, but also know that it's, you know, yeah. and they could complain about it and it was important to kind of politically complain about it as part of the research and with other colleagues, but, um, you know, they're not going to be able to solve that on their own. Mm -hmm. So just sort of trying to bring all those different tensions. Yeah, so they're kind of both reflexive the, about it and complicit about it. Kind of reminds us of stuff that in previous weeks we talked to with Megan mm -hmm. about in gender in the punk scene, yeah. Yeah, okay. yeah. Um, so, yeah, she'd talk about the different ways that they would, I guess, what, what we kind of coded or looked at as being examples of the feminine lumin luminosity that we are talking about in the last slide. But we saw this particular example as being a really good good one for these tensions. So bringing in the, the aspect of enjoying parts of your gendered embodiment in relation, you know, um, heter heterosexuality, yep. um, femininity, as problematic as all these things can be in terms of the broader politics of and, and how, you know, these things are positioned. Yeah. And so they kind of know too, don't they, that if they're behind the bar having fun and see yeah. you having fun, everyone in the bar is having fun, it makes work fun. Yeah. Um, time goes quicker yeah it doesn't feel as much like work even though you know in between having shots together they're going to you know clean up spew and pick up classes right yeah, yeah so like it makes something about the work more enjoyable but there's also an underlying understanding that it's a, it's a performance and there's a slight resentment hmm. and kind of almost a sense of am i doing the right thing sometime isn't there yeah. by doing this kind of stuff even though i know i'm being expected to perform hmm. in this way that i find problematic exactly so it's knowing all of these things at the same time. It's the it's the opposite of a naturalized performance, really. Like yeah. they will be so reflexive about it yeah. and aware of all of those tensions yeah. and yeah. potentially problematic positionings, as well as you know being able to enjoy it in the moment and yeah. have fun with your with your colleagues who you do like, hopefully in some settings yeah. at yeah. least, um, and you know being able to joke and have a good time. But you can imagine how much how problematic that would become if, you know, you weren't having a good time with your colleagues yep. or, yep. you know, you were experiencing you are having a bad day or yeah. they talked about those things as well. It's really hard to get yourself into that, oh, happy, fun, flirty vibe when you like having a really, really bad week. That's or, right. So or when... had a really bad experience five minutes earlier, you know? Yeah, uh, yeah. So that's when the lines between production, consumption and work and leisure are not blurred anymore. No. And it feels hard. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah, and that's a really good point too. It's not just necessarily that you bring stuff you bring to your from your own life, whether you had a bad day, you broke up with your boyfriend, you had mm. a went bad in an exam or something. Mm. It can be like, yeah, five minutes early, you've had to put up with some drunk dickhead that kind of sexually harassed you, and then you've got yeah. to go and ignore that and go and kind of do this behind the bar anyway. Yeah, yeah. so it's so contingent on all those things, yeah. but but it's expected. So that's the thing. Yeah. It's like 
yeah, yeah, those blurred lines yeah. of consumption and um, production of labor. Uh, that's that tension is really important in our work because yeah. it's yeah, <laughs> you can't just decide not to do it. Yeah, but then you are yeah. I suppose the obvious thing I probably should have said it in the intro is that the, the expectation to be in sexually harassed in this job is just completely normal. Yeah. It's not even thought of like, it was almost like eye rolling when we asked about it, right? Mm. It's like, yeah, of course we get sexually harassed. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I suppose that's one of the key takeouts in the reports we're writing now as we're kind of, you know, writing that this is something that actually needs to be considered as like, you know, not normal. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. We, we should continue to reinforce yeah. it by just saying, oh, yes, it's, it's something that's yeah. normal. We should be trying to look at how to actually pull it apart and yeah. um, enable it be, to be changed, not just through the um, workers themselves, but much broader yeah. policy, yeah. you know, right. management at yeah. the societal level. So these quotes too are about kind of creating a good vibe. Um, and I mean, we don't have to go into these ones as much detail, but mm -hmm. like, yeah, flirty personality. Like, but yeah, people talk about how they're friendly anyway mm -hmm. and they can just kind of bring that to work. Yeah. And that's kind of why they're good at the job mm -hmm. when things are going well anyway. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly, because those kind of sociality aspects are often what young women are positioned as being good at mm. and have cultivated the skills of being good at through that positioning. So yeah. it's that kind of broader socialisation kind of gendered aspect. But but then um, but being positioned to and expected to perform in that particular way um, means that they are kind of positioned by, you know, in sociocultural norms as being having to tolerate it at work and yeah. they described um you know being being able to be really friendly is what makes them really good at the job but also they really resented the times when that um the people would really take yeah yeah they would, people would cross the line and people would really take advantage of that kind of social yep. cultural positioning because they could yeah we're, i'm getting into the later stuff no, that's right, yeah, yeah. Stuff is so yeah, sort yeah. of connected in my brain yeah. <laughs> yep. um but yeah they talked about definitely being enjoying aspects of the fun kind of performativity of femininity and and having fun with your colleagues mm. um but it was always sort of these conversations were always part of that that whole we've been talking about with sexual harassment. So they'd be talking about the fun femininity and then in the next sentence they'd be talking about, oh, and then this other time this, you know, the opposite happened. So they're always yeah. sort of working in between yeah. the two the two poles and kind of yeah. veering <laughs> yeah. veering around in them. Yeah. Because that would be what a shift was. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then, and then they talk a little bit about kind of almost ironically doing these performances as well. It's kind of yeah. taking the piss and there's a sense that they're kind of, in a way, the expectations and all the different contradicting things we're talking about kind of almost make it impossible not to have some kind of ironic relationship with your yeah. own subject position in this in the in the job. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Because there was so there were there were so many paradoxes and tensions going on all the time that irony, I guess, is the way through it. Yeah. And it's that's a, a shared yeah, irony with your yeah. co-worker workers that kind of creates a solidarity that um amongst them, yeah. Yeah, make much more bearable. Yeah. And it, I guess that it's what allows you to fold all of those contrasting totally polar positions together if you can yep. do it if you're doing it ironically then that's the way you can hold it all yeah. and make sense because yep. otherwise you'd just be like yeah know, what's going on yeah. I, where yeah yep. how do i be in this you know yeah yeah so we're getting like so in the second part of the lecture we're talking about managing violence and we're mm. kind of moving towards you know from the enjoyment flirty kind of part of the job to towards that so mm. this quote i think um talks about you know crossing that line yeah from the lusty drunk vibe to you know, men just kind of grabbing them. Yeah, exactly. So they would. The previous quotes were really about you know not just that the, this kind of vibe of the bar is you know just only a sort of uh, I don't know unsafe or problematic place, which often in the literature is like you know nighttime economies, like it's, you know risk, risky risk, environment, risk, risk, risk. Yeah. risk, risk, risk. Um, so they'd be able to talk about how they could be positioned within that and enjoy part of it, but then they would say, you know, there is a very clear line. There is a line. Mm. And, again, in the literature, it's often so the way that this sometimes is written about. It's like, oh, one of the things that's so hard about, you know, sexual harassment and what to do about this in a management sense or policy is because, oh, the line is so blurred. Yeah, and, yeah. And, and the participants are like, it's not blurred. The line is very clear. Like, yeah. don't... <laughs> Don't say something to me that sort of 
betrays the power relationship going on here. You yeah. know, if you're going to behave in a way that makes someone feel unsafe, like that's that's not actually a subjective yeah. line. Like talking about explicit things that they want, you know, want to do, want to do to, the person, do to yeah. the person. I mean, that's not at all blurry. Yeah. Um, and But it's okay to, they say, you know, often people will sort of have like a flirty kind of vibe between them and that's different because it's a relational yeah. situation where you are having a conversation with someone instead of trying to, I guess, those heterosexual aspects of uh, relations yeah. <laughs> can yeah, be yeah. problematic because often they kind of do have those power yeah. aspects built into them. Yeah. The club and the flirty just moves beyond the connotations of stuff to like direct, yeah. like you know, not nothing, nothing, nothing subjective going on anymore. It's and it's a pretty obvious thing when that happens. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And it's disingenuous I think, to yeah. say otherwise, which participants pretty much across the board said yeah. it's not. This isn't. Yeah, <laughs> would make great. This is hard. Would make great yeah. to interview customers in this project as well. Yeah, so got, exactly. Yeah. Okay, so um, yeah, so Catherine here again is talking about like how to manage this kind of the labour of managing this mm. kind of sexual harassment, which is interesting in a way to put it as labour. Yeah. Because, again, it's the blurry lines here between, like, being paid to do this work, you're at your job, so you've got this kind of job to manage this kind of stuff that's not acceptable outside of the job. Yeah. But also I think the really important finding that you wrote about was, like, um, how women just kind of bring their skills of kind of being a woman in the world in every day into this to kind of do the scanning for risk and to understand what's going on. Yeah. Exactly. Again, their positioning and subjectivity as women mean that they're able to um, appraise the situations and have more of a uh, vigilance around mm. it because, they, yeah. as they said, I'm used to being vigilant. Yeah. I'm vigilant on the street. I have to be vigilant leaving work and just and any time I'm out in public, basically. So this vigilance yeah. is absolutely required at work. And the way that really kind of was borne out too is when we ask men in these positions about yeah. sexual harassment, they're like, oh, yeah, it happens, but you don't see it very much. And then women are like, yeah, it happens every shift. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So they're like, oh, I think yeah. I, I think it happens and I think we're pretty good at dealing with it and, oh, I couldn't really talk about it, though. I don't really know. Yeah. And, yeah, yeah it yeah. was there was a lot yeah. of distancing. And I think they were partly not wanting to speak for their, you know, yeah. For their colleagues, but they clearly didn't have it, yeah. any sense of their own experience. It's like they're standing next to each other behind the bar. Yeah, yeah. They, like, yeah, 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 exactly. So yeah, they talked about you know, just a, you can tell in a quote like this, it's this isn't even a specific example. It's just so broad, just like oh the leg, the leg stroke, the grabber, and the, it's just yeah. so commonplace. That it's, of it's not even worth having. Harassment. It's not even worth telling a particular instance of it because. You know, it just happens so often that, like, where where yep. to begin? Um, yep. She talks about kind of calling it out and being told to smile. So it's all that kind of very much stuff that, like, yeah, seems to happen every day. Yeah. Um, to the point where our, our participants were just like, of course, this is what's going yeah. on here. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And I, I think you can see the link, too, between, um, you know, different forms of harassment, gender inequality underpinning it because, you know, that thing, oh, just give us a smile, that is such a sort of seen as a, again, really mundane kind of yeah. gent like example. Look, I think we understand now as a society is, a, you know, yeah. showing gender inequality to be like, oh, women should just smile more. Yeah. But there's a direct link there between being told to smile more and, like, actual physical harassment. So yeah. these things are not separate. They're, they're really just yeah. part of a... Of the same. Well, yeah, in this situation, she's been told to smile after the harassment. Yeah. Exactly. So they're all they are all together. Yeah. Okay, so um yeah, so to like sum up this kind of section, I suppose. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, talk a little bit about the kind of broader findings and yeah, so yeah, I guess <clears throat> more to put it all together, you know, young women's subject positions as young women, but because of the dynamics of femininity currently in a kind of post-feminist context that McRobbie talks about, um, it, it is just, I guess, a really problematic space for young women to work in or this positioning is really problematic because um, the harassment is so normalised, the kinds of feminine performances are so normalised and there's there's very little space for them to to move in. Maybe they get to enjoy working with their colleagues and get to enjoy kicking mm. someone out if they're um, if they're able to. But I mean, it's also <clears throat> it's all on such a sharp 
edge. Yeah. <laughs> um, and it is really one of the most, I mean, you know, feminist scholars talk about this all the time, the kind of paradoxical conditions of femininity. And we think in the, the bar and in the front of house service industry is where those paradoxes are really, you know, perhaps more evident yeah. than almost anywhere else. Yep. Okay, we'll leave this section here, I think. Oh, no. Missed a slide. No, we'll talk about that um, moving towards the kind of violence, yeah. managing violence in the next part. Yeah, okay. sounds good.